Architecture and water are very closely linked um, in lots of different ways, and I'd just like to talk a little bit about that and how it might relate to uh, conditions in Iran. Uh, before I start, this is one of my favourite structures. Does anybody know what it is? Or where it is? Is it a plant? It's a plant. No, it's not. And you're an engineer. <laughs> <laughs> but you're not far off. And here's another one. Do you know what that is? Well, here's a, a better clue. There's, they're all seashells. They're all crystals that grow in the sea. And the elegance and simplicity and beauty of something that can grow out of seawater, out of calcium, um, is a challenge for architects and engineers to get anywhere close to. And so a lot of the work I've been doing has been trying to seek inspiration from uh, natural solutions to the kind of problems that we're facing today. But to talk about architecture and cities and buildings and civilization, it's quite interesting to look at a map of the world and the rivers, take away everything else. Because the rivers are actually where much of civilization started, because it enabled communication. London is London because it was once the best farmland in England. And it was on the river. And so it was easy to get up and down and communicate and to trade. And so farms grew and prospered because it's all nice and flat and, and, and uh, rich in nutrients. And the farms grew into villages and the villages grew into towns and the towns grew into cities. So many of the capital cities of the world, like well, London, Paris, what's that one over there, Cairo, um, Baghdad, um, are all grown up around rivers because at that time it was the easiest way to communicate uh, and what we've done in the process of have, we've put, taken the best farmland used it for cities and pushed the, the, the farmland out to more marginal regions <coughs> what do we do about that? One of the best examples is, is, is Venice which, was, which once uh, controlled the, the salt trade in the Mediterranean which is where its wealth came from which is an interesting thought At the other end of the scale, there can be no simpler or more elegant solution to the lowest cost method of building than a Bedouin tent. Just a simple wooden structure with ropes and uh, pegs covered in, 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 uh, in, in felt, in, in sheep's wool, which has the most amazing properties of both cooling and keeping the heat out. And when it rains, the felt closes up and makes it waterproof. And when it's not raining, it opens up and allows ventilation. Or growing a house on water, out of water, out of plants entirely. This is the, uh, the marsh Arabs in, in Iraq. Amazingly elegant, simple solution. And then uh, building again with palms and with leaves and how to use the building and the material to help air condition the building itself with simple uh, interventions like adding a, a wind tower to catch the wind and increase the ventilation uh, and having holes in the wall of the right spaces in the right direction to, uh, to channel the wind. And this, I think, goes back 3,000 years in Yad's Right. It's uh, um, absolutely amazing if you, if you want to talk about sustainable architecture, you can't really beat this. This is wind towers not taking any chances, catching it from all four directions and having water in there to cool the water and use the water to air condition the building. Um, using this kind of process, there was another amazing intervention from Iran was the invention of Quanats, where tunnels were dug into the mountain underground so that the water would travel from the mountains to the arid plains and as it did so it cooled and it cooled the buildings and here's a wonderful example the water coming from the mountains in the background uh, several kilometers to create this artificial oasis of a palace <coughs> in the middle of the desert um, and another illustration from a, uh, an architect called Hassan Fafi, uh, an architect 
um, on a building he recently built actually in Cairo using this principle but slightly updating it and again having a, 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 a ceramic uh, a pottery jug dripping water onto baffles where the wind travels through and the, and the evaporation of the water cools the building and the whole thing is driven by wind. One of the greatest examples of vernacular Arabic architecture, Islamic architecture, um, the, um, what's called? The, uh, the, 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 the Alhambra, the Alhambra Palace in, in the south of Spain where the air conditioning is provided not within the building but by the plants outside the building. So you have fountains and plants and trees and uh, beautiful smelling flowers and the building itself opens out onto the garden so that the, the garden is the cooler for the building. We've taken all of those principles in one way or another and juggled around with them and come up with this solution for growing crops in hot arid regions and this is the first project we did in the Canary Islands um, in the mid 90s and what we're doing is uh, we've got a wind catcher of a greenhouse but it's not really a hot house in the normal sense of a greenhouse but it's a cool house we're using evaporators made of cardboard and we trickle seawater down them so that when the wind blows through it cools the air and it humidifies it much like the cooling that I was describing in the Iranian wind towers. What that does is enable you to grow crops in hot arid regions where you wouldn't otherwise but most importantly what it does is reduce the amount of water the plant needs by cooling the air, reducing the wind speed, increasing humidity you can reduce the amount of water a plant needs maybe tenfold, maybe a hundredfold depending on what the conditions are which is fairly radical thought if you think about it for a minute because there's a lot of talk about water wars and shortage of water and drought and all of these problems facing the world but making fresh water from seawater is complex and difficult but possible but evaporating seawater is very cheap and easy and if your purpose is to cultivate crops in hot arid regions you could argue that water vapour has a greater value than fresh water and after all, what is the source of rain but water vapour? And if you haven't got plants creating water vapour, then you're going to not get the rainfall, which is, which is the process of desertification, reducing rainfall and creating this self-fulfilling <coughs> prophecy. This is the material we use, and it's literally is cardboard. You can see how it works. We trickle seawater over the top of it. The air blows through and it comes into intimate contact with the seawater and out the other side much cooler and more humid exactly the same as if you, if you wet a towel and put it over your head it cools you down and it makes it more humid and this pad, a lot of people say well doesn't the cardboard disintegrate after three months this is a pad that's been in use for seven years and you can see the slight whiteness here which is crystals of calcium carbonate that crystallise out of the seawater onto the, onto the cardboard effectively turning it into into a crystal, uh, like a coral reef. Uh, we developed a design for Australia. We chose deliberately the hottest and most arid part of the country, um, a place called Port Augusta, um, which is in South Australia, where there is no agriculture at all. And we built this pilot. Um, the sea is just over there, you can't quite see it. All this vegetation here is salt scrub, it's the halophytes that are growing in only on, on uh, seawater. The water table here is 100% seawater. And inside, um, we're using fairly top end, sophisticated Dutch style hydroponic. Um, computer control, sort of optimising the crop to get the maximum yield that we can. And there you can see the evaporators in the, in the background. Um, and the yields were quite spectacular. We produced seven, 70 kilos a square metre a year of crops, um, which has now gone on to be developed. Um, while we were doing this, we were thinking, how do you combine how can you deal with the whole energy thing? How can you, if you're in a hot sunny place 
How can you make maximum use of the heat and the sun and the light? And playing with these ideas uh, that, um, of concentrated solar power um, that are sort of coming in and out of fashion, but using, focusing the heat of the sun onto a central tower to produce, uh, well, to produce heat, to drive a steam turbine, to produce electricity, um, and using the greenhouse in combination with this to, uh, to take the heat from the steam turbine to make more fresh water, to irrigate larger areas. Actually, this design was developed for, for a sort of potential project in North Africa. Um, but if it's on a big enough scale to actually increase the water vapour that's going into the air, which in turn increases the amount of rainfall. And the project in Australia has now been expanded a hundred times bigger than the one I showed you just there. Um, here we have 20 hectares of greenhouses, which is growing 15,000 tonnes of tomatoes a year, which is 15% um, of the total demand in Australia. Just from this one relatively tiny footprint in a place where there is no agricultural activity at all. And we've got this concentrated solar array here, which does several things. It, it heats the greenhouses in the winter, and in the summer it uses the heat to drive the desalination process. Um, and intensive high yields inside the greenhouses. We got a lot of interest from that project, and for some reason um, a lot of it came from Somalia and Somaliland. There's a large community of Somalis in London, and we were approached by a lot of them saying, would that work in Somalia? And the short answer is no, most likely it wouldn't. Um, does anything work there? It's a difficult place to do anything. But we thought about it, and the more interest we had, we started collaborating with um, uh, Aston University, who helped us develop um, thermodynamic models. And we've, we worked out, if we made it really simple, could we get the wind to drive it? and not use fans, and not use control, and not use computers, and not need electricity. And what is the orientation? And if, if what you see here is the results of some of that modeling, that when the wind blows into the greenhouse, you get this turbulent air, but much cooler. And if you look down on it from the top, you see this area of cooling spreading well beyond the greenhouse itself. So we thought, well, let's use the greenhouse to create oases so that you have, let's say, a hectare of farm with only a tenth of a hectare of greenhouse and use the greenhouse as the air conditioner for the farm and enabling other crops to grow outside. And this is construction which was completed last year. Um, these are the evaporators. The, the entire structure is made of wood. The entire thing was built by a local team of pastoralists. We need solar PV to drive the process which is on top of our um, workshop and the desalination unit is that box there which is about the size of a washing machine and I'll tell you that costs about £5,000 and it's the first desalination machine in the Horn of Africa and the Horn of Africa is the world's centre of water insecurity which leads to food insecurity which leads to insecurity insecurity well why has nobody ever thought of putting a desalination plant there when we send so uh, huge quantities of aid to help prop up the system and I find it quite baffling. What's the productivity of that desalination? Um, four tons a day. Four, four cubic meters a day. Four cubic meters a day. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, would, it would be six cubic meters a day if it ran for 24 hours but we don't have enough power to run it because it's, it, 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 essentially the solar PV runs out of power once we've made it four tons. And if you scale it up, would it be... Oh, you can scale it. It's, it's infinitely scalable. Uh, the first crop, first harvest, I think it's probably the first cucumbers, tomatoes uh, uh, that have been grown in, that, in this part of Somaliland. Um, and we're also making salt out of the concentrated brine. So, although we, we you hear about the place being, you know, this, that, that drought leads to famine, and there are droughts every few years, and there's a famine, and the, all this aid goes to the place, what would it take to make the place self-sufficient? And the answer is quite a lot, but actually, in the grand scheme of things, it's it's very achievable. Technically, it's not a problem. It's just a 
it just requires a change of thinking. I had the privilege and the luck to travel around the coast of Iran last year um, at the invitation of Iran Wharf and Power Company just to look at the feasibility and the possibility and different sites and all the rest of it. And the place I fell in love with actually was Chabahar, which in Baluchistan, um, Chabahar translates, I believe, into English as Four Springs. Is that right? That's right. Um, which it is. It's just always a beautiful climate there. It's just always, always a lovely taste. Never too hot, uh, never too cold, that's for sure. Uh, but it is very dry. And um, essentially, this process would work anywhere on the coast. Some places are better than others. But Chabahar, I thought, was the best of all for lots of reasons. How's that for architectural water? This is erosion. Mm. Um, and this is, this is why all your pots are buried. You know, it's, it, there's a particular kind of soil there that's very soft, that erodes very easily. It's the most extraordinary, striking uh, thing. And this is just outside Chabot, huh? It's When I was there, it wasn't this green. Um, it, most of it, most of the coast looks like this, which is quite a challenge, but in fact... That sort of landscape is absolutely ideal. It's flat, it's by the sea, um, it's very windy, but it provides uh, huge potential for growing anything. And we ran, we ran the, the, the climate conditions of Chabahar through our model. I don't know if you'll be able to see it, but the red line shows the temperature throughout the year, and the blue line shows the temperature that's achieved with evaporative cooling. Um, so we can get sort of, we're taking temperatures from 35 in summer down to sort of 25 uh, or 20, which is much more ideal, better suited for crops. And the wind, this is a windrose at the bottom, the wind always, nearly always, comes from the sea. It comes from the, the, the southeast or the southwest, so it would be very easy to configure a wind-driven solution to the problem. So actually, technically, it's, it's, it looks to me like a very straightforward piece of engineering and intervention. Are there any questions? We haven't done anything yet. We've, we've, we've written a report and we've left it with them. And I think that the difficulties are the politics of the thing, you know, of using UK consultants and stuff, and it's just difficult. Um, but so far we haven't managed to make any progress. It's early days yet, but we shall see. Anyway, if anybody has any questions, I'm very happy to answer. Most of the projects you've done, are they private or government? Uh, half and half. Uh, the Australia project was private uh, and it was financed by sort of a, vora a voracious venture capital organisation um, called KKR in New York. Um, but it's a, it's a very, I, I call it the, the Goldman Sachs approach to tomato growing. I mean, it is, it is just a machine for making money, but it, 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 it works incredibly well because it just hits if you like, the sweet spot of what's needed and what works in Australia. It wouldn't work in, in Somaliland. But everywhere is different, you know, the climate. One of the, the biggest difference is that uh, Australia gets very cold in the winter, so you need heat. You need, it has to be a normal greenhouse in the, conventional greenhouse in the winter, and it has to be a seawater greenhouse in the summer, and so, it, it, if you like, it's twice the cost of a normal greenhouse. But the, the solution we developed for... Um, Somaliland is about one hundredth the capital cost. But you know, there's other conditions there. The, the Somaliland solution I, I'm confident would, would work in, in the south coast of Iran. And then what did the Ministry of uh, Water Energy want to do? What was the objective? Uh, I have to be careful what I say, but that they, it seems to me that they've made so many mistakes mm -hmm. with engineering solutions to water. Um, in, in Iran. And one of the biggest ones is the, the uh, Got Van Dam, I don't know if you know about that, the Kurun River, which has now been poisoned yeah. with salt. And there's just no end of, of oh, sort of rather disastrous, huge engineering projects that have, that, have, that have had, you know, unintended consequences of sort of making the water salty. Um, but it sounds as if what you're saying is quite optimistic. That, that a lot could be done. I, yes, it's not, it's not a, such a big deal. I mean, the Got Van Dam, uh, to be honest, it is an embarrassment to, um, to, the, 
to the uh, uh, Iran IWPCO, Iran Water and Power Company, you know, who, um, and it, it was seen as an obvious solution to a problem. And I think the problem was known, you know, that it would happen, that it would make the river Karun salty, which in turn has done a lot of damage to the agriculture in Khuzestan, downstream of it, um, and created huge, huge lakes. Uh, seas of salt water that have destroyed all the vegetation. It's a big problem. So, uh, and I think what, what would be good is to find a small scale solution that um, is actually built and implemented and people can see it working and producing positive benefits and see that it's not the fault <coughs> of anyone outside who wants to control anything. Yeah, which isn't an easy thing to do, as you know, in the wrong I mean, you can't just go there and do it. That's, that's the thing. It, no, it, but that, I think, is what's attractive about what we hope to do here is by having such good connections with Iranians in Iran, then I think it would be... And it, you know, but I think to get it on a big scale, people would, you know, investors would want to see what the returns would be. That yeah, would yeah, be something yeah, sure. to really try sure. to, to, to work out. Sure. I mean, another way of looking at it is, what, what if you don't do it? You know, well, then disaster. It's disaster, yes, because large parts of Iran have, over the last few decades, lost fertility. You know, I mean, someone told me, you know, what's the point of building a school in Luchistan when it's going to be uninhabitable in 30 years' time? I and mean, this is what, to me, is, is worrying, that the, 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 the less something changes, that, you know, it's not, it's not going to be better. Yeah, we did a we we did a, a similar model for Arvaz, um, and we uh, you know, to, to do something with the Got Van Dam using this model, and it's much hotter and much drier in Arvaz, and we found that for parts of the year the place is, is actually uninhabitable mm -hmm. because the temperatures are so high there that certain days of the year, if you go outside, you will die, mm -hmm. you know, because your the wet bulb temperature. If it goes above 35 and you are 37, which means you can't cool down, mm. you know, you're dead uh, very quickly. So it's, it's, it's frightening how this is sort of creeping up. So you don't need, you only need a few degrees of extra heating and less cooling and um, high humidity, and it's disastrous. Can I ask one question? Uh, what can you do about exactly that point of, uh, on a smaller scale, say for schools or something, yes. where the intended to have water, fish for drinking water? Um, it's all scalable. It's all scalable. It, it just that's what we would want to do. This I think, I yeah. think we, yeah, we, we, we uh, our school, we would want to be sure that the school itself was sustainable. And this if the school would produce its own crops, tomatoes, that's even better. Oh, this yeah. project is. Um, it's, it's a hectare normally. The greenhouse is a thousand square meters. Um, the total cost of everything was about a hundred thousand um, pounds, and it should be. It should. It should, when it's fully operational, be that sort of thing—a combination of orchard and indoor and outdoor. And we we have an ambition this year to um, to scale it up and to build a training centre. Because that's one of our biggest problems, you can see. Absolutely. I should. The, the, the greenhouse is no use to anybody if you can't. If nobody knows how to grow tomatoes, that's one of our problems. And actually, horticulture. If you are, if you are learning, if you want to grow, if you want to live and make money and grow food and grow tomatoes, it's a fantastic way of learning because the more you learn, it, 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 it's. To understand it is where, the, is where physics, chemistry, and biology overlap. You have to understand all these things. And then you want to find out about pests and disease and what nutrients and everything. Yeah. And it's, um, the information is out there if you know what to ask and be motivated. And uh, for some reason or another, it isn't on the curriculum, but you know, growing food is sort of rather central to our survival. But Yes, well, but there, there, were, there have been schools in the past that have had a farm school of extra yes. pupils from the school who really got to know about how you brought up on a farm. But very few pe people today know about actually growing things and animals and things, how to look after them, things like that. But so what I think um, Hardy and I would love to do with this school is to have all the pupils be absolutely engaged with 
sustainability. And, and a practical thing behind the schools showing what could come would be really what we absolutely, need to absolutely, yeah. I mean, the, kid, the kids in the UK think that strawberries come from supermarket fridges. You know, that's that's where they. Yes. So, so are you suggesting that the development of this region could, or the, the key to unlocking it, could actually be using desalination to promote agricultural industries in this region? So that's. that's yeah, absolutely, problem. absolutely. That, I mean, there are challenges, but people will say that you can't use desalination for agriculture because the cost of the water is greater than the value of the product which may or may not be true. It depends how much water do you need to grow a kilo of tomatoes. So then my next question was, what would you say are the top three barriers preventing it from happening as we speak? The top three? Yeah. Well, the top one is, is politics. <laughs> the second one is, I suppose, vested interests. Like it's how do you unravel a complex structure of interventions that have been found wanting. Um, I don't think there is another one. Money? Well, yes, but it's not... Because you mentioned before it's that not half of the capital cost would need to come from the government, but and the other half might come from private. I, I am from South Australia, by the way, and you mentioned that Sun Drop Farms yeah. uh, installation just in Port Augusta, and you said that was completely privately funded. So it, well, no, sorry, it got a, it's got a very small grant from the government of, hmm, can you remember what it was? I can't remember, it was 10, 20,000. Hmm? Six million. Six million, was it? It was, it was a 150 million investment. Yeah. Yeah. So um, it, it, was, it was private money was the driver. How easy is it to maintain a system like this? Um, what is being built? There's no cost. Well, the system was built by locals. Right. We trained them how to do it. Um, they've had to repair things ever since. You know, nets have been torn, they've stoned them up. Um, occasionally, the desalination machine needs a new something or another, and we send bits out. I mean, th there is a maintenance issue. Um, I think where, where your living depends on it, you find a way of fixing it. You know? There's, I mean, it's uh, the only type of vehicle that works in Somaliland is a Toyota Land Cruiser, which is the most expensive car you can have, but it's the only one that works. And they maintain them and they, that's what they use. And they're ubiquitous across the country. I was wondering if um, this is well proven in terms of yield and investment. Companies such as Goldman Sachs are putting their money into it, let's say, at large in Australia. Oh, it took five years to get there. Uh, from the pilot to getting the investment. Well, wondering why the countries such as Saudi Arabia or UAE who are well connected with the international world are still heavily using the conventional desalination uh, units and just causing their full concentration. Uh, yeah, that's a long story. The, I, there are two problems. Well, here's another problem actually why it won't work in Iran and why it doesn't work in Saudi, and that is because farmers in Iran or Saudi don't pay for electricity <coughs> or water, it's a gift from the government. So if you can, if the government say here's power, here's a grant to dig a borehole, <coughs> pump water out, why would you turn the pump off until the water's disappeared? Oh, then you need a deeper well. Oh, you've just drained the field next door. And that's what's happened. Uh, only a few weeks ago did Saudi Arabia ban subsurface pumping of water which is a big move. It means all the farms, all the existing farms that were put in business with big government grants are now out of business. That hasn't happened in, in Iran as far as I know, but that is the case that um, Kerman province, for example, which is the world's centre of pistachio, 90% or was, um, the, the yields have been declining at 25, 50% something because of over abstraction of water, because of over irrigation, because of Taking water out of the ground faster than it comes in gets you out of trouble for a year or for 10 years, but not 20 or 50, because you end up with salt. <coughs> Politics again. Sorry. sorry, I think it was 50% of Australia's need for tomatoes. No, no, uh, 20. No, 15, sorry, 15, 15, 15, 15. 15. 
Can I just mention one thing? I think uh, another reason that Baluch has done, if, if you want to help as a charity, the best place to me is places like Sistan and Baluch You know why? Because it's an untapped land. The government has not actually been around a lot. The more you see involvement of government, perhaps this is more a place that you just try to just get away from it. But the fact that they haven't been around, this is you are left with the communities. And I think that's actually a plus for mm. charity. I think that's you go to Apple site where the oil is, where it's, where it's rich, you see lots of companies, governmental companies, extracting the oil and thousands of kilometers, square kilometer CO2 all around. So I think it's actually building a school for those people, getting the boys away from being smugglers and the girls being a third or fourth wife in a place that the government not very keen to just be involved in that region. It's a plus for people who want to do charity. Yeah, this, this is about 10 miles outside Chabahar. <coughs> and, but it goes on and on and on. I mean, there is infinite expanses of flat coastal plain with nothing. Well, I wish... Hmm? I don't know. I don't know. Um, it's not yet the state, I imagine. Well, I don't know. Whatever is in Chabahar belongs. There are some private owners, but the rest belongs to the development company of Chabahar. So, but they are land, getting land is, a, is an easy thing actually. They already offered me, if you want, just a piece of land which I just even mentioned. Your place which was close to Chaba or Konarak, little mm -hmm. they even mentioned it. Yeah. But I hope to just see one day, I mean the solution, the, you know the miracle, the, what's the stick of Moses, the, the breath of Jesus, or anything is if you just make a green land all the way through the, uh, along the coastal side of Oman Sea by using this seawater going through something, it's like um, the wind towers of Yaz, so, some natural forces, you can make all of that area green and you can just produce the crops that at least is enough for the province. And not only that, so it is, it's, it's, one, it's one stone and he, three birds with one stone. You get agriculture, you get drinking water, and you get salt. So it's just, you, know, you get tomato, that water, nothing goes back to kill the fishes. You get, you get it's like you run to they eat everything on the ship. So you get water, they just take everything out of it, nothing goes back, and every single part of it is very useful. So to me, it's just, I can't find the simplest I just want to add something about Chabahar. It's just um, not as intact. It might be intact quite uh, intact right now, but uh, it's one of the only places which is being exempt from Trump's uh, sanctions. And yes, so I, that's right. It's a free port or something, isn't it? Or it's a trade free zone or something like that. I don't know what that means. It looks like this. Huge, this is something <coughs> less than a year old, and uh, there's a huge interest from India. Yes. They used to go around Pakistan, and uh, you might find it quite um, challenging right now. But in future, I think the land is not going to be problem free in terms Well, the water is going to be more of a challenge. I mean, Chabahar at the moment gets all its water from a desalination plant. Um, so, you know, that problem is not going away. Yeah. Uh, That's what we use, a reverse osmosis. Oh, you, that was the visual yeah, yeah. So I thought it's uh, just the salination unit. Uh, no, no, no. Well, we're doing two things. We are, <coughs> we, we are making fresh water to irrigate the crop, but we're air conditioning the growing area with seawater. Okay. And so how about the sandstone? Because that area has the sandstone. Yeah. And yeah. the glasses. That's right. Taken. That's right. What is on subject of seeing those glasses yeah. is quite high. Sure. And, uh, no. You have sandstorms because there's no vegetation. That's, I can tell you where we're working in Smileyland, a hundred years ago, it was covered in vegetation. We can't, you don't see a single tree now. 
some people say that's climate change, global warming, but I, it's, it, it's clear to me that it's overgrazing and deforestation for um, charcoal production. Mm -hmm. well, <coughs> very interesting in addition to the Somali Land project, which sold the budget for a product. And how good is the quality of the salt? Is it edible? Is it? Oh. <laughs> 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 I dare you. I dare you. Yeah. Have you ever bought more than salt, more than sea salt? Mm -hmm. It costs, how much does it cost? £2.50, two, yeah. about £10 a kilo which is 10,000 pounds a tonne retail. It's excellent, yeah. Ours is as good. It's, uh, we, we, we make it the same way. So you have done the chemical analysis. There is nothing... I've tasted it. We, we, uh, you can... Uh, you, we, we have actually done chemical analysis, but if you do a chemical analysis of mould and salt, you will find its purity is something like 95%. And one of the strengths of sea salt is that it's got a little bit of everything else in it as well. Yes, all of those things. So, what sort of purity are you looking at? You know, if you want pure sea salt, don't buy more than. Very, uh, yes, it's the obvious thing to do with it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. So, um, thank you. Thank you.